know why you're here? Yeah. Tell me why you're here. Yeah, because of Elizabeth. This is Richard Ritchie. He was the only suspect in the infamous Elizabeth Smart case. When was the last time you were in that house? In April. When I picked up the title. Tell me what you know about the kidnapping. I don't. Oh, You couldn't live in this valley for the last two and a half weeks and not know something about the kidnapping. Tell me what you know about it, what you've heard on the well, news, what you've I've seen in the press. I've broke into the Smart's house. Okay. Took Elizabeth. Okay. Now I'm the number one suspect. Richard was arrested nine days after the kidnapping. While he spent the next two months in jail, police still couldn't trace Elizabeth. On August 30th, Richard died after suffering from an aneurysm, taking with him all hope of finding Elizabeth alive. Elizabeth, if you're out there, we're doing everything we possibly can to help you. We love you. We want you to come home safely to us. Okay, guys, be quiet. If you scream, I'm going to shoot you, but if you don't, I won't harm you. Does his voice sound familiar to you? Yeah. Can you tell me where you've heard that before? No, I can't remember. Four months after this interview, Mary Catherine, Smart's younger sister, came forward with crucial information that would change the investigation. She remembered whose voice she heard. Tragically, Richard Ritchie was actually innocent. Okay, you said you met him on the street. Do you know what street that was? Mm -hmm. downtown, they said in that area, you know where a lot of homeless people go and... Uh-huh. And when was the next time that you saw this man? Oh, he came up to our house. We came in the front door, and I know he saw me or Linda's going to our room. Was Emmanuel the man who was in your bedroom? I'm not quite sure. It might have been. You're not quite sure, but it might have been. It took another five months before they found Elizabeth, and when they did, they were shocked. What I saw there was a girl who was not the same Elizabeth that left. The details of her kidnapping ordeal were so awful that for 10 years, Elizabeth Smart has fought to keep them private. June 4, 2002, around 2 a.m., Elizabeth woke abruptly. I had heard the words, I have a knife at your neck, don't make a sound, get up and come with me. I had felt the knife line across my neck, I could feel its edge. I didn't know if this man had gone through my house already, surely if he had gotten all the way upstairs to my bedroom he must have killed someone. Or but I did know that my younger sister was in bed next to me and that she was still alive. And I didn't want to even begin to imagine what would happen to her if I didn't go with this man. So I immediately got up and I did exactly everything that he said. This man, he took me up through my backyard. We were about to cross this last street when all of a sudden he pushed me down behind a bush. I remember he was holding me down, but I was just able to lift my head up high enough to see some headlights coming down the street. And I thought he must be planning to have a getaway car come and pick us up. And this car was going so slow, but it kept on coming, kept on coming, passed right in front of us and kept on going. And I'll never forget reading the word police written alongside of the car. The police car was gone, and now her kidnapper was pushing her onto a steep trail going up the mountain. He was right next to me, holding onto my arm like this, with the knife with me like this. Oh my god. Snatched out of her bed at knife point, Elizabeth Smart was confronting an unimaginable reality. She'd been kidnapped. I remember getting farther and farther away from my home. We kept going what felt like forever. We'd gone so far, we'd crossed right over the top of the mountain and we were starting down the other side. And we came to a grove of trees and we entered the grove and I saw how this man had leveled out a piece of ground on the mountainside. There he'd set up a tent outside of which there were tarps lying on the ground and there were tarps up hanging in the trees. And out of this tented area walked a woman. She had on 
long linen robes. She had on a long headdress and she gave me a hug. It was a hug that was strong and it was domineering and it was saying, don't you dare do anything I don't tell you to. Then the strange woman led her into a tent, ordering her to undress. And then she just left me alone, sitting on the bucket in the tent, crying. The tent door unzips, and in walks this man. And he changed out of the dark clothes that he'd initially kidnapped me in, into a robe. And he knelt down next to me and he started to speak to me. He said, I hereby seal you to me as my wife. And I remember just screaming out, no. He looked at me and he said, if you ever scream out like that again, I will kill you. He said, in God's eyes, we're married. And it's time for us to consummate our marriage. I will never, ever forget how I felt, how broken I felt that even if someone did find me, what was the point? I was useless. I was disgusting. I fell asleep thinking those thoughts, and when I woke up, there was this man kneeling over me again. And this time, he had taken a thick metal cable and had wrapped it around my ankle and had bolted it into place so that I couldn't run away. I remember looking at this cable and just wondering, how long would I live for? Would it be a year? Would it be a few weeks? Would it be many years? What if it was so long that I forgot who I was? And that thought really, really scared me. So I started to think of everyone and everything that was important to me. And at the very top of that list, my mom. She was the one person who more than anything, I didn't want to forget. I didn't want to forget anything about her. The way she looked, the way she sounded, the way she smelled, the way that I, I felt when she told me. Just so safe. And as I sat there trying to just absolutely engrave each of these memories on my brain, I had one very specific memory come to mind. My mom just said, Elizabeth, you know, I love you and I always will. Nothing can ever change that. No matter where you go or what you do, you'll always be my daughter and I'll always want what's best for you. And as I sat on this mountainside, I realized that she was right. I realized that it didn't matter. All of these things that had happened to me, as terrible as they were, it wouldn't make a difference to her. We would still be a family, and even if I died and never saw them again, they would still be my family, and they would still love me. And when I realized that, I knew that I had something worth surviving for. I made the decision that I wasn't going to let these two captors win. I wasn't going to let them take my life from me. I would do everything I possibly could to survive. And I'll never forget the day, nine months later, we were walking up State Street in Salt Lake City. Yeah, um, could you tell me, is this like how, um, if I think I see that Emmanuel they're looking for? Uh, this is what it is. And all of a sudden, there were police cars pulling up around us and these police officers were jumping out of the car. And this was not the first time that we'd been approached by police officers. When I got out of my car, I asked them what their names were. They gave me Peter Marshall, Juliet Marshall, and Augustine Marshall. And they came over and surrounded us and started asking questions. And my two captors, they kept giving the answers. This girl standing off to the side really stood out to me because she had this disguise on. It just didn't fit. She was wearing a wig, a gray-haired wig, claiming that she was 17 or 18. She was the only one out of three wearing some sort of disguise. Marcy, she immediately clamped her hand down onto my leg and in my 14-year-old mind, I just knew that if I did anything or said anything, that I would be killed and then they'd go after my family. She then said something like, I think you know who I think I am, but I'm not that person. And the officer started asking me questions and there had been a whole backstory prepared by my two captors that they told me I should say if I was ever questioned. And so I started giving those answers because they were standing right next to me. So at one point I could see uh, her t-shirt actually moving. Her heart was pounding very fast in her chest. Her eyes welled up with tears. You could tell she wanted just to physically say it. 
And then one of the officers, he said to his other officer, she's, she's just too scared. We need to separate her from them. She can't answer with them right there. And then finally, one of the officers said, well, if you're Elizabeth Smart, your family misses you so much and they love you so much and they have never given up hope on you the entire nine months you're gone. Don't you want to go back home to your family? And it was just at that point that I felt like, well, no matter what the consequences are, I don't care. I want to go home. The detective said, Ed, um, I want you to stop everything right now and come directly down to the Sandy Police Department. I got down to the Sandy Police and an officer said, oh, Mr. Smart, come this way. And I went down this hallway and turned to the right and I stood there. And I looked at this girl and I said, Elizabeth, is it you? She said, yes, Dad. And I, I stood there crying and crying and crying. We're here to announce officially that we have found uh, Elizabeth Smart. As he sat there holding me, it was the happiest moment of my life. And I just knew that whatever lay in front of me, whatever, whatever might happen, it was going to be okay because no matter what, my dad was going to be there. I knew it was going to be okay. She's sharing her story to help other victims of abuse, hoping that even with all its terrible details, it will help them move on, just like she has. I want to reach out to those survivors and those victims. I want them to know that these things do happen, but that it doesn't mean that you have to be defined by it for the rest of your life. You can move forward and you can be happy. I think it's first important to note that everyone is different. For me, I had what I would consider a lot of different kinds of therapy. I'm grateful that I can make a difference. I'm grateful that I can speak out. I know that when we are faced with trials, we have a choice. We can give in and surrender, or we can fight and we can move forward. It's not what happens to us that defines who we are. It's what we decide to do. It's our choices that define who we are. Don't give up. Don't surrender. Move forward because you never know what you'll be able to do with it. You'll never know the lives you'll be able to touch.